Hello everybody, it is 3.30, which of course means it is time for one of our HSC um, afternoon STEM shows. And so, today, I'm joined by a number of our live animals that live here at the Science Center. Because today what we're talking about is a little bit of a follow-up to the storybook that Lee read yesterday during rabbit reading called How Animals Defend Themselves. This is a topic that we talk about a lot here at the Science Center. It's something that is kind of the core idea of a lot of the animal demos we do is talking about how all these animals out in the wild are able to protect themselves from getting eaten. And so, like, the basic, like, core tenet that you have to understand coming into this is, like, animals don't want to get eaten. Like, seems like a pretty simple concept, but hey, we got a pretty young audience who does when she is afraid, when she is upset. And it talks about it in the book. Let's see if I can... Let's read the exact passage out of it. It says, The blue-tongued skink is a kind of lizard. When frightened, it sticks out its huge, bright blue tongue. This scares away animals that want to eat it. And so that's true. Like I said, when she is upset, she will stick out her bright blue tongue. But it doesn't really talk about what, how it scares things away. Like, I see the color blue all the time, and I don't run away from it in fear. So why is something like that an effective way to protect yourself, I think, is an interesting question. And so there's a couple different ideas on that. It's actually something that, as far as I know, science honestly doesn't have a great, great answer for. Um, one of the things that is good to know is that a lot of times in the wild, bright colors means poison. So a lot of animals that are poisonous or venomous will have bright colors on them to sort of show off that they are poisonous or venomous. And so that's used as a warning. And so because animals that are poisonous will use it as a warning to say, hey, I'm poisonous. A lot of the times you will see other animals that start adopting the same color patterns to trick things into thinking that they're poisonous. Um, and that really only works if the sort of bright colors equal poison thing is something that you really see a lot within the area that that animal lives. Um, it doesn't make sense to say, like have a bright blue tongue to say, hey, I'm poisonous if there's nothing else around you that is poisonous and bright blue, um, which is something that is, as far as I know, not the case with the bearded dragons, like or not the bearded dragons, the uh, blue tongue skinks, is that there's not really anything else that they would be necessarily like trying to emulate with bright blue to say, hey, I'm poisonous. It's not something that they're really doing. Um, one of the things that I have heard, because I've, I've read up on it a little bit because I was curious about this, um, one of the things that they will do sometimes, um, and is kind of a model that is trying to figure out why they stick their tongue out like that, is that apparently one of the things that is a major, major predator, where are you going, for blue tongue skinks in the wild is uh, predatory birds, things like raptors, eagles, hawks, things like that, are one of their biggest predators. And the thing that's kind of interesting about predatory birds is they pretty much across the board have really, really, really good eyesight. Um, a lot of them can see a much wider spectrum of colors than we can see, and they can see a lot more closely than we can see. They can see in much dimmer light conditions than we can see, just kind of across the board, better vision than what a human has. In particular, a lot of birds can see in the ultraviolet spectrum, so they can see purples and blues way, way, way better than we can. And so I've seen some models out there, some hypotheses, that say that the reason that they have the blue tongue and the reason is that the color is what it is, is that when they know that a predatory bird is nearby, they can stick it up and that it is such a like bright purplish bluish color that it's actually like hard for a predatory bird to like look directly at. It's like how, you know, you turn your computer on in the morning and it's like, or you turn your light on in the morning and it like hurts your eyes to like have them open for a little while because you're not used to the light. It's kind of that sort of thing is what one of the prominent hypotheses is as far as like what the actual tongue is for. Like I said, but it's not something that's really all that well understood. Um, but she definitely uses it as a display when she's upset. It is a thing that really she only does when she is upset about something. So it's not a, not a positive thing when she's sticking her tongue out. Um, but as far as like what the actual purpose behind the blue tongue is, it's something that is still not all that well understood beyond like, yeah, they're using it defensively. But something else to remember is that like it talks about the blue tongue skink here in the context of just the blue tongue, but most animals are going to have a bunch of different ways that they protect themselves. So one of the things you might have seen happen when I picked her up is she peed. And so 
that uh, that is something that you will see a lot of animals do, humans included. Um, when they get very scared, they will release your inner feces as a means of protecting themselves. Um, and it's very effective. Like I said, a lot of stuff does it because it works. I mean, I'm sure our northern Minnesota audience out there, I'm sure most of you have picked up a frog or something out in the wild at some point and gotten peed on, and you, know, you put the frog down afterwards, generally. It works. Um, but I think we'll move on here. Who's next? There's a moth that we don't have, so... I think what we're going to do is I'm probably going to be the show again tomorrow and we're going to talk about some of these other critters that we have in here that we don't have directly at the Science Center. So today is going to be kind of live animal stuff and tomorrow is going to be probably some less live animals, but still talking about animals. Uh, but the next one that we stumble upon in the book is a box turtle. And so the passage it has on this is turtles have a hard shell that protects their body. The three-toed box turtle has a special kind of shell. The bottom part of its shell can fold up, keeping the turtle safe inside. And we actually have a three-toed box turtle. That's the exact species of box turtle that we have here. Who is inside here. And their depiction isn't very accurate, but hey. <laughs> we, uh... What they are talking about when they say the bottom part of its shell can fold up is something that maybe is a little confusing, but if you look at the bottom part of our box turtle here, you'll see that there's kind of this line that goes across it. And that line is actually almost like a hinge. And so when she really wants to hide inside of her shell, she can suck her arms and her head in, and then she can actually close the front part like a door and then also close the back part as well. And so most turtles can't do that. That's like a box turtle exclusive thing. And so I frequently make the argument that box turtles are the best at hiding in their shell of any type of turtle. Um, the shell is cumbersome in other ways, like there's always a trade-off whenever you're doing stuff like that, so like the reason turtles are as slow as they are is because they have to have some really goofy leg anatomy basically to make the, sh the, tur or the shell work. Um, the other thing that comes with having a shell like this is this is also a turtle that is not very good at swimming. So if you look at um, you know, another local species of turtle that we'd have around here, like a painted turtle, what you'd see is that the shell is a very different shape. It's much flatter, which is not as good for protecting yourself directly, but is better for being mobile. And being mobile is oftentimes a better defense than just like having a suit of armor on. You'd rather be able to run away than have to take the hit. But if you're gonna have to take the hit, I'd much rather have this shell than a, a, a painted turtle shell. And again, as we were talking about with the skink, it's important to remember that, again, these things usually aren't relying on just one specific way of protecting themselves. There's usually a whole suite of things that they're using. And so, in this guy's case, this is another one that frequently will pee when I take it out, just when she gets a little bit upset. So, again, it's something that most animals do, is that, uh, that waste dump tactic. The other thing to make note of is, and you saw this on the skink as well, actually, is there's a pattern on the back. And so, Generally, most critters are going to be relying on camouflage to some degree um, in order to protect themselves. You know, it's just doesn't take a ton of energy. It doesn't take a ton of, like, resource investment to maintain. And just having a certain sort of color palette to you goes a long way to protecting yourself. And like I said, because it's so cheap resource-wise, you see pretty much everything does it. It's so, like she has kind of, you know, this kind of speckly pattern on her back. But what we saw with the, uh, the skink was more of a, a stripey one. So and basically anytime you're seeing basically any sort of pattern on anything, pretty decent guess that it's for camouflage. You'll see some stuff out there that's like display purpose stuff, particularly with uh, like birds, you'll see a lot of display patterns, but for like reptiles it's pretty much always camouflage. Alright, moving along. There you go. And here's a critter where we do not have a live one present, but also happens to be our, our cover critter for our book. This is a porcupine. And so it says for the porcupine, the North American porcupine's body is covered with thousands of sharp quills. If an animal tries to attack it, the porcupine swings its tail back and forth. The quills stick into the attacker when it gets hit by the tail. And then it has a little inset there that shows the tip of a porcupine quill. And porcupine quills are super cool. Uh, porcupine quills are, their hair is what it is, is they're basically just super specialized hairs. They're big and they're hollow hairs. Um, 
But you can see on the tip of them, it has this really unique shape on the end that has all of these like little barbs at the end of it. And so porcupine quills pull out of the porcupine really, really easily. So like if you get stuck by a porcupine, the quills are sharp and they have these barbs, so they stick into you and it's really hard to pull them out of yourself. Uh, but the other end pulls out very easily, like much easily than like our hair pulls out. It just, they just kind of fall right out a lot of the time. Um, like I said, we don't have a whole porcupine here, but we did have some quills down in the basement. Um, I can see there's maybe, I don't know, 12 quills in there. But like I said, it's interesting to think about how these are the porcupine's hairs. You know, they're a lot thicker, they're a lot heavier, but that's really all they are. It's made out of the same stuff, it's just bigger. Uh, it's all keratin in there. Um, the other thing is, I know some people do like quill work with porcupines, and that's why if you ever watch people doing quill work, which is very much an Ojibwe thing, a lot of Ojibwe people do quill work uh, as a pork form. Um, that's why you see them holding them in their mouth as well, is to flatten out the barbs on the end of it so that when they're actually using them in their quill working, they don't have to deal with the barbs. So you hold them in the mouth to smooth them out, basically. Alright. Skunk. Warning, stay away. And so we talked a little bit about this with the uh, skink, where it talks about how some animals use coloration as a warning. Um, this one's talking specifically about the skunk, so it says, The striped skunk has two white stripes down its back. These stripes tell enemies to stay away. If they don't, the skunk sprays them in the face. The spray doesn't just smell bad, it can also make an enemy blind for several hours. And so, again, we don't have a live skunk here. I have worked with live skunks, but we don't have one here. Um, but you can see exactly what they're talking about with those two stripes down the back. So it kind of converges into one spot on the back of the head and then spreads out into two going onto the tail. And something that I, is interesting that they don't talk about more in here is um, they talk about like the coloration, but they don't talk about the whole rest of the display that the skunk goes through before it'll actually spray you generally. Um, you kind of have to try to get sprayed by a skunk most of the time because um, skunks will do things like, you know, they have their coloration that says, hey, yeah, I'm a skunk. This is pretty iconically a skunk thing. Stay away from me. Um, but you also have things like they'll poof all their hair up, they'll do their like little arch back thing, they'll stick their tail way up in the air, they'll do their like little stomping thing that they do. They'll even do like handstands sometimes before they'll spray you. Like they'll go through this whole rigmarole before they spray you. Um, and the reason they do that is because they don't want to spray you. It's an important thing to remember is that animals don't want to fight you. Fighting just takes up energy and doesn't get you a whole lot back for it generally. So if something is has a tool that it can use in a fight, um, it, even if it does have a tool, it generally doesn't want to use it. And so things like this, for a skunk, it's all, you know, it's going through all this because it doesn't want to use its spray, because it takes a while to remake that spray, and if it doesn't have its spray, it doesn't have it for the next thing that's a threat. So it's trying to spook you off before it has to use it and leave itself defenseless for the next thing that comes by. Um, and this is true with a lot of animals. The example I always like to use is rattlesnakes. You know, why does a rattlesnake have a rattle? Because it doesn't want to bite you. It wants to. It wants to uh, let you know that it's there. You know, when a rattlesnake is rattling its rattle, it's saying, "Hey, I'm here. I'm dangerous. I don't want to bite you because I want to keep my venom. I don't want to have to remake all this venom that I have right now because I want to eat later. Um, don't make me do it." And so, like I said, you'll see that a lot with animals: is these sort of display patterns that they'll do before they actually get into a scrap. Because even if you are something that is, like, bigger and stronger than your opponent could, like, fight a thing off, um, there's still always a risk of injury anytime you're going into any sort of conflict with a thing, you know. I talk about this oftentimes with the snakes, is that one of the most common injuries that domestic snakes get are rat bites, because people put live rats in with them, and yeah, the rat loses the fight generally, but, you know, rat bites still aren't good for your snake, so... I said, fighting generally is a bad plan, kind of regardless of what species you are, and so a lot of animals will go out of their way to avoid doing it. Um, the other thing that's kind of cool with this, it talks a little bit about the skunk spray, and yes, we all know that the skunk spray is, is uh, smelly, but it talks about how it can make an enemy blind, and I don't know if anyone here has ever touched skunk spray before, but it's kind of oily, it's kind of sticky when you actually touch it. Um, and yeah, if you get caught like right in the face with it, it can be problematic for your vision. The other thing that is really interesting about it is because it is kind of oily and greasy, 
and like sticky, it actually creates problems for one of the skunk's biggest predators, the great horned owl. And so great horned owls are one of the only things that hunts skunks, and the reason that great horned owls are good at hunting skunks is because they're active at night when the skunks are active, and they have pretty much no sense of smell whatsoever. And so even if the skunk does spray, it doesn't really mess it up too much. Like I said, unless the skunk is able to actually like hit it directly with the spray. Um, because great horned owls rely a lot on their vision, so getting sprayed and having your vision be impaired for a while is a real bad, bad situation for an owl to be in. Like I said, it's also got this like stickiness to it. And so if you're covered in like stickiness as a bird, it's gonna make it difficult for you to fly, especially with owls. Owls have, they're bad at flying relative to most birds. <laughs> and so there's all sorts of uh, relatively easy to impede an owl's ability to fly um, just by virtue of the way their feathers are, basically. Interesting thing, owls cannot fly in the rain. Their, uh, their feathers absorb too much water, and they can't fly because they get too heavy. It's not a problem for, like, any other bird. Uh, let's see. I'm missing. Oh, yeah. Hognose snake. And so, with this one, it says, The hognose snake and the American possum both fool enemies by pretending they're dead. The hognose snake even drips blood out of its open mouth. And there's a few different species of hognose snakes. The one that's actually like depicted in the picture here is not the one we've got. I guess I don't know what species that is actually supposed to be. But there's a few different types of hognose snakes, and I don't know all of them off the top of my head. Um, I mean, easy thing to see is that it's got a, a white belly, and ours does not have a white belly. And so this like playing dead display is something that can be handy for a number of different things. Um, it's really handy for again, avoiding a fight. So if this is a situation where like you're potentially coming under attack because you stumbled into somebody's territory and they think you're a threat, playing dead can be good. This is why people, you'll hear that you're supposed to do this with like bears, um, is because a lot of times bears aren't attacking you because they're hungry. They're attacking you because you're in their territory and they're trying to get rid of you. And so you'll hear the playing dead thing as a thing for bears sometimes. Um, the other thing that playing dead is really great for is that a lot of animals won't eat something they find that's already dead um, because it's hard to know how far gone it is basically as far as like being a piece of food to eat and you don't want to be eating something that's really gross and rotten and like is going to make you sick after you eat it. And so that's why you see like with this one you see it has the bright colors on the belly and those are again bringing up bright colors again like we did with the uh, the skink. A lot of times means like, hey, poison, hey, gross, bad, don't eat it. And so you'll see when the hognose snake is trying to avoid being eaten. You roll around in the back, you pretend to blade dead, and you, you're trying to look like a really old, desiccated hunk of gross carry in there. And it doesn't work on everybody, especially stuff that's going to be like really reliant on like uh, smell to know if this is a good piece of food or not because you don't smell dead. Although some of them can release scent too that I assume helps with that. Um, but again, one of the big predators for these guys is going to be things like birds. And so if you're a hawk or an owl and you see this, you're like, well, I can see this and I see these colors and I say, eh, I'm not, not going to risk it on this because I don't really have any means of knowing how good this piece of meat is. I'm not going to worry about it. Um, but like I said, if you're something like a vulture that eats carrion anyway, yeah, scoop that right up, who cares? So um, defenses are oftentimes specific for specific predators as well, and that's important to remember as well, is that not every defense is going to be as effective against every predator as other defenses are. Um, the other thing you'll see uh, hognose snakes doing sometimes is uh, kind of flattening out their bodies. And this is something that a lot of animals will do. It's kind of just a, in the broadest sense, it's trying to make yourself look big. Um, and this is something that like the skunk is doing as well. When I talk about how the skunk like arches its back and puffs out its tail and all that, it's trying to make its silhouette, trying to make its profile look bigger than it actually is. Because again, if you are looking big and imposing, something's less likely to attack you. You're not gonna pick a fight with the big strong guy. You're gonna pick a fight with the little one that you're relatively confident you can beat up without getting hurt yourself. Yeah, and you'll see uh, a number of different animals do this, and you hear it called playing possum, because possums are famous for this. 
Um, but the playing dead thing is a very valid strategy as far as keeping yourself alive in, in certain contexts. And then the very last thing that, almost the very last thing that it has in this book is our leopard gecko. And so it says, if an enemy grabs the tail of a leopard gecko, guess what happens? The tail breaks off and keeps on wiggling. This surprises the enemy and gives the gecko time to escape. The gecko's tail will grow back, but it, but it won't be as long or straight as it was before. And so we actually have one of our leopard geckos here dropped off part of her tail some months ago. It's probably been six months by now. And so we can actually see, I should have brought the hunk of tail up, but we actually kept a piece of tail. It's in a, in a bottle of alcohol downstairs someplace. Um, but this is a gecko that has gone through that. This is a leopard gecko, same species they said in the book. And so if you look really closely, you can see right here is where it broke off. So you can see this is all original tail here. And you can see there's like a little line where the pattern and color changes a little bit. And then this is all new growth tail that's right here. And so again, this is something that they really only do when they are feeling threatened. It's something that they do when they're scared. And we don't know exactly what the situation is with this leopard gecko. Like we walked in one morning and the tail was off. We don't know if somebody had spooked it the afternoon before and we just didn't notice it or something happened overnight. We don't know. Um, but the other thing it mentions with this is that the tail never grows back quite the same. And like I said, this is something that happened probably six months ago. And this is as grown back as it's going to get. Like it's not going to ever look better than this. This isn't something that is like still improving. And you can still see a little bit of a difference there where, you know, the tissue just feels a little different. It's a little harder than what the, the original part of the tail feels like. Um, the other thing that is true of the tail when it grows back is it doesn't have any bone in it. Um, and that's part of the reason why it oftentimes will come back kind of misshapen is because they don't actually regrow the bone. It's just cartilage that's in the middle of it, and it doesn't hold its shape quite as well as bone does. So you'll see it sometimes with the leopard geckos where rather than growing back the tail kind of in the shape of a tail, it'll just be like a ball that grows out. It's almost like a little balloon that grows on the back of them. Um, and that's a product of just like not having as much structure in it as it historically has had. And again, just for the sake of reiterating a point again, this is also an animal that is relying on a bunch of different defenses as well. So again, you're seeing a pattern and a coloration to it that would be beneficial for camouflage in the areas where it lives. Um, the other thing that's really nice about being something like a leopard gecko is you can get into lots of nooks and crannies that a lot of animals can't get into. Like if you're something that's this size, it's really easy to get somewhere that like a bird isn't going to be able to get you. And we've talked a lot about birds because they tend to be the things that prey upon little critters like this, birds are probably the biggest predators for them. And so a lot of the defenses that you see, especially in these smaller animals, are ones that are kind of designed for birds. Um, and yeah, being little and kind of climby and diggy like this is something that is really effective against birds because, hey, a bird's not gonna chase you down into a burrow. They're not very well equipped for it. A bird's not gonna be flipping rocks over trying to find you. You know, how are they gonna do it? A bird wants to catch you out in the open and scoop you up and take you away. Um, and so that's, I think, where we're going to call it for today. We brought out everybody, right? Um, thank you all for watching. Like I said, tomorrow we're probably going to continue on with this. I'm probably going to bring some more stuff up from the basement and talk about some of the other things in there. We maybe only talked about half of the defenses it talks about in this book, so we're probably going to touch on the other half tomorrow. Um, meanwhile, uh, the Headwater Science Center is currently open. Uh, we're open 9.30 to 5.00. Uh, Monday through Saturday and then on Sundays we are open 1 to 5 so swing by after lunch on Sundays. Um, we are currently requiring masks so bring a mask in if you are wanting to come to the Science Center. We do also have them at the front desk though so if you need to if you need a mask or you can't find your mask we do have them available as well. Um, otherwise once again